All right, hello everyone. My name is uh, Leonardo Albuquerque. I am a master's student in robotic systems and control, and I'll be talking about artificial general intelligence, the promise of a profound societal transformation. Well, um, this talk will be a little different from the others in the sense that it's very much like the old adage of the blind man one step away from a pitfall. It hasn't happened yet, but it's so close, so inevitable that you can already start talking about how to rescue him when, uh, when he's falling. So we're gonna talk about the blind man, which is our society in our case, of how it's got to be one step away from a pitfall. And then we're gonna discuss a few scenarios, not all of them, because that's, that's impossible, um, of what to do when uh, we're actually falling. Well, a couple of years back, John McCarthy, the man who coined the term AI, wrote and published this note, answering lots of questions that people emailed him about artificial intelligence. He, had to, he said he had no intention of claiming the absolute truth of the answers, but in this note, he mentions how Although not limited to it, AI stems from this desire we have to replicate our own intelligence. But where does our intelligence come from? And well, it starts when we are babies. And let's use this, this baby as an example. There are different studies, but according to Lisa Feldman, a distinguished professor of psychology at Northeastern University, we're not born pre-wired. It's not like we have this out-of-box brain circuit of anger, joy, or sadness. We learn these wirings um, from actual interaction, primarily from our parents. Because evolutionarily, we could not increase our own cerebral mass indefinitely, for birth reasons and all, I mean, our heads would be too big. We learned as a species to use each other's brains to wire and augment our own through these teaching procedures, which is quite clever. Um, so see that this high level intelligence itself arises from this notion of a shared community of individuals interacting with each other. And naturally, this baby becomes a kid, and this kid grows up to be a man. And throughout his life, this man keeps being surrounded by other people who keep pushing him to improve, to challenge himself, to learn, to compete, to cooperate, to grow, to build this high level intelligence by means of interaction. And one day, if we go back in time to the origins of humanity, this man sees a banana. And uh, this, this man recognizes in this banana something that he would very much like to have. And he has an idea. You know, there are other people out there who might want this banana and who don't know how to find one. And maybe I can trade this banana with them for something better. Maybe I can specialize in finding bananas, meaning I'll use my most precious resource, time, to learn a skill, making my time valuable to other people, and then I'll trade it for resources that will allow me to either do what I want or get what I need to live a fulfilling life. It is the classic problem of scarcity. And basically that's how markets happen. It all comes to people trading their time for knowledge and resources, and society starts interacting within itself, and just like a baby developing all these complex structures from interactions, it also starts developing all these complex multi-agent institutions. And however imperfect they might be, all of them kind of have in their root this intention to aid the humankind in pursuit of this fulfilling life. I already want to say that all of these are stakeholders here today, uh, because even though I tried, I believe I cannot exclude any of them of what is about to happen to this story we're constructing here. However, even though it might be a bit reductionist, um, we'll try to observe these stakeholders through three of these institutions, academia, uh, the industry, and the government. We will eventually throw an economy in the equation to add some spice to the soup, but not now. Um, and these three institutions represent a very interesting part of society. Academia has this dichotomic core of pushing the boundaries of knowledge further through scientific exploration of advancing society, but at the same time, making sure that we don't forget our past by passing it on to younger learners. The industry is like the oil to the engine of society. Um, it, it's, it's basically what keeps it running, what, keeps, what maintains its energy. They are the ones mainly providing the food you eat, the clothes you wear, the cars we drive, the computers we use to attend this lecture, um, and a great portion of the jobs which promise to somehow fulfill people's lives. And the government looks at all these interactions and realizes that the humankind is a rather messy kind, and that it needs structure and it needs order someone to remind them of who they are and not to let principles go astray. And thus the engine of society runs. And one of his major years here is technology. I don't want to exclude the government here, but it's, it's direct development help and happens between academia and industry mainly. Um, and we've seen a huge, huge development technology in the past few decades. And at some point along the way, we saw the term artificial intelligence appear. Shout out to Mr. John McCarthy. And one of AI's subfield is machine learning. It's a field um, which strives to give machines representational power, a way to encode meaningful information of the world and use it in order to achieve goals in a way it was not explicitly taught. So it learns. 
And uh, from machine learning, we've seen the sprouting of various frameworks, um, deep learning, generative modeling, reinforcement learning, which have been able to achieve some remarkable results. But soon, we started hearing this discourse of, look, the results we get from these things are quite fantastic, but it's not like it can do anything else. We can develop these amazing image classifier, which can tell a dog from a cat, from a horse, but it has absolutely no capacity of, for example, writing a book. In other words, we have these great localized individual modular overfit systems, which are very nice, but are still so far from a human brain. It's as if we're developing these uh, little pieces of the brain, but had absolutely no idea how to intertwine, it, intertwine them, how to create this, this generalized intelligence. But then science seemed to remember something. It went back to how our own intelligence emerged, and it remembered that we did not evolve alone. Very likely, as we've seen in the beginning of this talk, um, our intelligence only got to where it is today because it was collective in the first place. And because it had to fight to survive, it had to compete, to cooperate, to interact. And so people had an idea. Um, why don't we subject all these machine learning algorithms to the same neurological processes um, we underwent as human beings and see what happens. And from this idea emerged a very, very interesting pool of papers with some very interesting concepts. What they realized was that they, when they pitched algorithms against themselves um, and against each other, um, that's, that's mainly what self-play means, and conditioned their success to objectives which required mutual interaction, they saw emergence of something they called an autocurriculum. An autocurriculum is a self-generated sequence of challenges that arise from, uh, from competition of interacting agents, agents, when one is constantly trying to surpass the other. A recent paper that came out uh, this year, or maybe it was, it was in the end of last year, um, show that emergence of autocurricula for the first time prompted spontaneous to use, which means that in order to achieve its objective, the algorithm was able to recognize structures other than, than the agent itself and to learn how to use them in a meaningful way to succeed. And this is quite close to, to when you see a monkey which grabs a rock to break a coconut or something. And we haven't even got to the most intriguing part yet. Under this new paradigm, um, researchers have started seeing the emergence of traits of transfer learning or the ability to, having learned a task, um, use the knowledge acquired for this task when performing a completely different one. This is something we humans are masters at, but so far machines hadn't been near achieving. Another thing is that this list of skills is very indicative of what people have been calling meta-learning, or the ability to learn how to learn, right? This allows not only for a machine to learn a specific task, but to learn any task, using previous tasks to build upon the performance of the next one. Also see that for machines, data is the analogous of what time is for us. In order to learn something, we need time. Machines, they need data. Um, and with self-play capacity, these machines can start generating data in basically in their own heads, um, experimenting with different self-simulated scenarios, which also gives them the ability to be self-taught, to discover problems alone, to solve problems alone, to create and improve things by themselves. Um, with the right objective functions, they can do like a baby who learns to interact socially with other humans, empathize, negotiate, display emotion, understand language. And if they don't have the right objective function, they can figure out what the right one is. When we reach meta-learning, we kind of solve the problem of solving problems. And this takes us to the next step in the industrial revolution. It takes us to AGI or artificial general intelligence. And this term is going to refer to the point where machine intelligence surpasses human intelligence and enters this positive feedback loop where it just keeps augmenting itself indefinitely, not needing any other human input anymore. And who knows, I mean, where it will stop or if, if it will ever stop. Um, and this point is called the technology singularity. And the recent results have shown it might be way closer than we actually expect. AlphaGo, an algorithm from DeepMind, mastered the game of Go, um, which is extremely complex, approximately 10 years before technology actually expected it to get there. Um, and that was in 2016. And from there, uh, the algorithm has, has improved so much that we now have Mu Zero, which is a system capable of learning multiple tasks all by itself and to achieve a higher performance than every human being on the planet at all of them. Yes, these games are not exactly how life works, um, but coupled with other recent advancements in probabilistic planning and state estimation, we can definitely see the first rudiments of AGI actually emerging. And now we finally get to this interesting part. And it might get somewhat uh, philosophical here, so bear with me. Um, but now that we have a picture of the blind man and how we got to where we are, we need to talk about the fall, right? 
what is then the impact of such an AGI system in the foundations of our societal institutions and how does that affect us? Well, first, a system which is able to perform better than a human being at a task, providing constant, stronger, more precise, more reliable results, will tend to be preferred by the industry to perform this task than a human being. That's what you see actually happen in dozens of factories in China, where fewer and fewer workers are actually human, and more and more machines are doing the job. But that's, that's kind of something we already know, right? Other people have talked about it in this seminar. And uh, what I'm indicating here is actually the next step. It's the step of machines which, as I said, are capable of solving the problem of solving problems. These machines are not only able to do your job, they are actually able to create the machines that do your job, to learn to do your job by themselves, and to teach each other in an objective way. They're able to repurpose themselves to diversify. They're able to harvest raw materials for building others of their kind. They're able to develop their own power plants and sources. They're able to program themselves to self-manage. They are pretty much self-sustainable. This is not only taking jobs from manual workers, this is taking jobs from engineers, programmers, developers, and operations and supply chain managers, and then from higher positions of the scale. They will be able to oversee, to a mathematical degree, the whole production chain of society. Um, and ironically, and I know this claim has a lot of backbone discussion to it, um, this might even lead to a better exploration of the environment, uh, because planning and optimizing for natural resources will be done pr predictively. We as human beings, I mean, we're born from humans and we are short-sighted to our actual needs of a preserved planet. But these machines are literally made of natural resources. If they do not manage them properly, it's, it's basically the end of them. Um, and again, they will do it to a mathematical degree. But, but in any case, this is another discussion. With these machines, why, why does the industry need you anymore? Why does it need us anymore? How, how are we as human beings valuable? Of course, at least initially, uh, we had this intrinsic human value related to our interactions with each other, right? It's nice and all that there's a robot making hamburgers, but after a while, we go back to Mr. Bill's hamburgers because he's a nice guy and he talks to us and he tells us jokes and he makes us laugh and we can actually create this bond with him. And perhaps for a while, things made by humans will be sort of vintage and we'll like them over the robot made goods. But at this point in development, machines will learn how to socialize and how to be empathetic and how to entertain us as human beings. And then even the interesting, intrinsic human advantage that we have, because we are humans, will be kind of lost. We have heard at least a dozen people saying that they prefer, at least I have, that they prefer their dogs as a company than, I don't know, some specific other person. Then why not a machine which will potentially be able to empathize with you maybe much better than a dog? Um, and if you want to talk about creativity and improvisation, you should take a look at what state-of-the-art general adversarial networks and attention models and temporal models are doing. It's, it's literally unbelievable. And when we reach this point, it will be even more unbelievable. Um, so suddenly we, we don't have intrinsic value for the industry anymore. Um, progressively here, we tend to system this, this system of owners and, and not of workers. There's no need for human employees, but there's still people owning these machines and telling them generally what their goal is. Remember, and this is important here, um, that one of the only things I have not touched here is will. I do not believe, and this is a personal opinion, I do not believe AGI gives these machines any form of will. It will give them the capacity to solve problems in an unprecedented way, but do not mistake this for the Terminator hype or, or anything like that. These insanely powerful computers are still owned by men and subject to their will. In any case, maintaining and providing will be taken by machines and owned at least initially by those who have the monetary power to access them in the beginning of this transformation. On the other side, we have academia, now systems which can assemble themselves from scratch, which have mastered the art of solving problems, of discovery, improvement, and exploration. Here comes the realization that we have in fact automated the inner purpose of scientists and researchers, because both industry and academia are automated Teaching other humans how to do these things won't even be necessary for scientific advancement. In the end, we're left wondering, okay, so we kind of don't strictly need researchers or scientists anymore. Another pillar of human contribution basically taken. And of course, this has a major impact in our economy. Remember that we're not talking here about a loss of a big percentage of jobs or the automation of most processes in universities and research institutes. We are shortening this horizon to a scenery where the foundational purpose of both industrial and academic institutions are in check for human beings. Our initial idea of selling our quality time in exchange for resources breaks down because suddenly your time isn't as valuable anymore. But if we can't sell our time, how do we get the money to buy what we want or need? 
the concept of price itself hasn't vanished because resources are still limited. So there's still competition for them and therefore not everyone can acquire them, right? Well, not exactly. The concept of scarcity is inherently based on our ability to generate what we need from the sources we know. Once you have a system which is able to discover new sources of energy or develop new types of food or even explore other planets in useful ways, the limits of scarcity will slowly weaken. Already from the beginning, having machines which don't get tired working for us will favor an increase of abundance. And perhaps suddenly we will start to enter a world where there in fact is enough for everyone and we don't have to compete for resources. I have absolutely no way of proving this. I know it's a very, very large claim, but it is likely that such an AI system will be able to solve the problem of scarcity, at least at a theoretical standpoint, a problem which shaped our society as it is in the first place. But it is exactly this model of a society which allows powerful and wealthy people to be powerful and wealthy, right? Power is based on scarcity. Wealth is built on scarcity. So it might happen that at some point along the way, men will not want machines to solve the problem of scarcity so that the powerful can keep powerful, especially if these powerful people are ahead of this transformation in the first place. This is a bit uh, of a different perspective because we always tend to see this rise of artificial intelligence as somewhat evil and the strive of men defying its pervasive innovations as good, but we have to remember that AI holds the promise of solving some pretty dark problems, which would help a lot of people, um, but which not everyone might want solved. And a very interesting realization, which is this sort of inflection point in this discussion, is that if you allow a full AGI system to replicate and program itself independently of a human input and give it the ability to look at the world and choose which is the most, uh, most important problem to solve at any point in time, then the notion itself of ownership over these machines is hindered. If you allow this, owners are suddenly out of the loop. Even if they get to tinker with the objective functions of these machines, the feedback loop can drive it back to where they, they had previously designed. And in fact, we lose uh, our inherent ability to control these machines. Therefore, I see basically two worlds here. If men decides to keep control to maintain the status quo of power and wealth by not giving these machines the ability to choose which problems to solve, but rather by telling them explicitly what to do with their intelligence, then bigger companies, the ones who either developed these systems or bought it, will keep ruling. The number of required human jobs will not be zeroed out but it will be reduced only to those who decide what the machines will do next. Um, the resources produced by these machines will be somewhat owned by these people and the whole rest of the population not needed will be easily explorable. As these will represent a huge, huge majority of the population and as we've seen countless times in history, if things get dark, revolution is likely to come about and the world might get messy. But we cannot forget our governments which I believe this level of technology will not have essentially foundationally changed. Most of what is predicted for it is, is uh, this increase in transparency and this, this, this diminishment of bias. Furthermore, men will always want to be at the head of its own civilization. In this world, I believe it will be very much a responsibility of the government to regulate such companies so as to guarantee an equilibrium where fairness and equality are taken into consideration, maintaining human dignity in such an unbalanced time. So in this scenario, we have companies with few employees above the machines, coordinating production services and scientific development, and the government strongly regulating these companies so that dignity is maintained. On the other hand, if men decides to sacrifice power and control for the possibility of eliminating the problem of scarcity, we might walk very rapidly towards a world where indeed there is no explicit need for humans to work. At first glance, this seems almost like an unsensual word, world, but remember a part of the population has already lived like this in the past. Um, in ancient Greece, those who were wealthy enough and could afford to have some slaves didn't have to work. Um, these men would go to the public plazas and wander about life and the universe and truth in nature. Um, we saw one of the golden times of philosophy emerge. These men did not do what they needed to do, but what they liked to do. And this was not at all unproductive, as it, it would seem in the first place. Much on the contrary, it was a time of great enlightenment of mankind, at least it's considered to be. Some were fascinated by geometry, others by astronomy, religion, oratory, politics, and they all grew in knowledge and wisdom. So perhaps this is one of our futures in this, in this scenario. Um, a world where abundance is, is enough, both in resources and time. And uh, so much so that we can kind of go back to a life where we do what truly inspires us. And remember, 
we don't need to work anymore, but not everyone works because they need to. A lot of people work because they like what they do, and it doesn't mean that in this world we won't be able to do that. They still will. Um, perhaps a lot more freely, and this time not leveraging slavery, but this ultimate feat of men's scientific endeavors of creating a system which would free us of our daily worries and would allow us to live our lives boundless. Perhaps our philosophy will then be, uh, will have its foundation on an already very much studied problem today, which is that of interpreting and understanding the minds of these machines which work for us, uh, which is quite, quite an intriguing and hard problem. Of course, we can always ponder whether giving machines the control over which problems to solve, which led to this, this panorama here, um, won't allow it to at some point identify us as the problem. And I'd rather leave this uh, and how to prevent it as an open question here, because otherwise this talk would take way more than 20 minutes. But my personal note is uh, that I really do believe we can ex assess this, this problem algorithmically and put some constraints to this um, undesirable spin-off. So just, just to conclude here, regardless of which road we take, AGI will surround us and reshape our entire concept of society. In the end, what I want to trace back is the decision is that the decision between these, these, uh, these different worlds, between not only these two, but all the different paths humanity can take in the face of AGI, um, all very distinct from what we have today, will depend on a choice that our programmers will make not so many years from now when coding a couple of objective functions. Based on what we have discussed, I believe that if we want a post-singularity world in which there's dignity for people, um, there's only a couple things we can do to make sure that the people programming these objective functions today will build them towards abundance and not scarcity, and that they will not subject to those powerful men who will attempt to limit the advancement of machines in defense of their own power. And that we will start thinking very deeply in how our governments can regulate these companies in order to prevent what can be the biggest power imbalance I think humanity will have ever seen. AGI is coming. It is showing its signs concretely, um, and it will change a lot of what we have built our society to be. If we make things right, though, I think it can lead to an even better world than the one we know today. Thank you very much.